Okay, uh, I think we are ready to start. And um, thank you for joining us for this uh, lecture today. I'm Bauman Bakhtiari, Executive Director of the Basketball Institute. We have another fantastic speaker for you today, uh, Professor Leora Handelman, who will be introduced by our research fellow, Professor Matthew Shannon. Uh, before getting to Matt, uh, I'd like to introduce our institute and our lecture series. This is our second lecture this year, and we have been very lucky to have uh, scholars and experts on Iran to join us for these webinars to shed light on the deeper historical connections between Iran and America. Uh, today's lecture is by Professor Handelman from Tel Aviv University. She's been gracious to join us at a late hour from Tel Aviv, and we're very grateful to her. Uh, please uh, keep checking our events and programs, and we have another great speaker for you on December 13th. Uh, Professor James Good is gonna talk about his book, Living Loving Iran. And he served as a Peace Corps in Iran in 1968, and the book is a memoir. So we please join us for that lecture as well. Thank you very much today, and I just pass it to Matt for an introduction of Professor Handelman. Thank you so much, uh, Bahman and Delara, and to everyone at the Baskerville Institute for supporting the lecture series. Um, it's a it's a great honor to have with us today Dr. Leora Handelman Bavor, who is the director of the Alliance Center for Iranian, Iranian Studies, and also a lecturer in the Department of Middle Eastern and African History both of which are at Tel Aviv University. She is the author of Creating the Modern Iranian Woman, Popular Culture Between Two Revolutions, which was published two years ago by Cambridge University Press, and it's the subject of her talk today. She is also the editor of Iran, Then and Now, Society, Religion, and Politics, and the co-editor with David Menashri of Iran, Anatomy of Revolution, uh, published in 2009. She defines herself as a cultural historian and has published numerous articles and papers in addition to these books, which cover a variety of aspects of Iranian history during the 20th and even 21st century, with a special emphasis on gender, media, and literature. Uh, so with that, we'll hear more today about creating the modern Iranian woman. Dr. Hendelman Bavor, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just uh, make sure that... Um... I can share my screen. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the Baskerville Institute for hosting this event. I'm especially grateful to Bahman for the invitation to talk about my book. Also to Matthew and Delara for taking care of all the details of organization. Uh, and I, I want to take advantage of this opportunity and also uh, congratulate Matthew for uh, your own book. I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, creating uh, the modern Iranian woman represents a long personal journey. It evolved from my PhD dissertation at Tel Aviv University under the academic supervision of Professor Billy Melman and Professor David Benashri, followed by quite a few years of additional investigation, probing, and study. I guess a good place to start would be to point out that the book is divided into two main parts. The first explores the history of Iranian women's magazines and rise of commercial magazines in Iran. The second part of the book focuses on the formation of the modern woman in the 1960s and 1970s Iran before the downfall of the Pahlavi monarchy in the 1979 revolution. From the outset, it is important to note that academic literature on women's magazines in other countries have merited considerable attention in two central ways. The first was following Betty Friedan's 1963 seminal book the Feminine Mystique, which paved the way to feminist criticism of stereotype depictions of women in media. The second wave, or revivalism in literature, followed Naomi Wolf's bestseller, The Beauty Myth, How Images of Beauty Are Used Against Women, which was published in 1990. 
Although media-based studies on Iran has gained more ground in recent years, and there are books and studies on the media, Iranian studies have neglected to produce analysis similar to studies on women's magazines in the US, UK, and Southeast Asia. The general impression emerging from the scant studies on the history of Iranian journalism in the West was that women's magazines of the late Pahlavi era are little or of no historical significance. Although widely read and circulating, at times in greater numbers than daily newspapers, Iranian commercial magazines have often been dismissed throughout existing literature, not as, as sources, but uh, as a topic in their own right. Three interrelated reasons are widely used to rationalize this neglect. The first uh, drives from popular magazines association as semi-official publications. The second, is the tendency to regard them as girly publications preoccupied with lowbrow entertainment, exhausted with ads. And third is the inclination to view them as Western style gossip sheets immersed with commercial femininity and commodity culture. In other words, they are and were disregarded on the grounds of being either state propaganda uh, of low quality content or imperialistic and capitalist scheme. This line of critique originating from attitudes toward popular media and its audiences that prevailed in the 1960s and most of the 1970s served a starting point and an important point of reference for the discussion throughout my book. In order to understand women's magazines in the second half of the 20th century, I found it imperative to track down their singular history and concerted development. Women periodicals in Iran emerged in the early 20th century. This was uh, at approximately the same time that new perceptions about the nature and function of the press, anti-imperialist nationalism, and the idea of the modern woman were consolidating. As the first decade of the 20th century unfolded, the regular provision of news by newspapers, people's growing interest in them, and their absorption by an emergent westernized urban middle and upper middle classes were a sign of novelty, progress, and change, no less than the progressive ideas these publications endorsed. The road was obviously not free of obstacles. The publication and circulation of women's writings was a serious infringement of long-standing sociocultural taboos. Therefore, they encountered occasionally fierce objections. The appearance of women's periodicals a century ago was not just a sign of some form of social change. It was implicated in the very process of change itself, and hence, it was an important component in the definition of the modern woman in Iran. As a popular print format, the first women's periodicals in Iran were obviously not an isolated phenomenon. By the early 20th century, journalistic ventures for and by women were already advanced throughout urban centers of the Middle East. Several women's supplements and journals were published in major cities in the Middle East most notably in Istanbul, Alexandria, and Cairo. Each of these earlier publications has its own particular experience, its historical context, and cultural inputs. Nonetheless, taken together, they share several broad features that apply to the Iranian case as well. The earliest initiatives by female pioneers in the Middle Eastern print media emerged against a backdrop of rising notions of modern nationalism and indigenous movement for reform. This reform movement were led by male bureaucrats and intellectuals. They were motivated by the ideas and activities of women's suffrage movement in Western countries and often inspired by Western women's magazines and in layout, style, structure, and content. Despite heavy borrowings from their Western counterparts, contrary to common assumptions, 
Western liberal notions were not simply mimicked by Eastern periodical press. For instance, issues concerning morality were especially contested and women's restrictive social conditions were locally contextualized. Conveying the thoughts and feelings of literate and educated women predominantly from the more established segments of society, early journals by um, and for women of the regions were primarily concerned with education or more precisely with women's rights to acquire modern knowledge. Hence, the, primarily, the primary feature to characterize the modern woman entailed access to wider sources of updated and practical information. Iranian women's early initiatives in journalism were conceived and born out of the turbulent years of the popular movement for reform that reached its climax in the Constitutional Revolution of 1905-1911. The Constitutional Revolution temporarily provided a congenial atmosphere for self-expression and the first newspaper published by a woman in Iran, which was founded in 1910 in Tehran. The publication was called Danesh, Knowledge. It was founded by a woman who identified herself as Khanome Doktore Kahal. From its very beginning in 1910, this periodical proclaimed itself to be a useful newspaper for girls and women on issues of morality, domestic science, child rearing and married life. It did not offer high political news, but rather instructive information, practical knowledge with entertaining elements in the form of translated serial stories. From the pages of Danesh, it became clear its proprietor, similar to her male contemporaries, recognized the advantages of the press in educating the public. Furthermore, she was somewhat aware of the marketing strategy of write for women, but direct the selling to men. The newspaper made a direct appeal to male readers and exhorted them to read the newspaper to their illiterate mothers, wives, and sisters, so they too would have the opportunity to benefit from its essential information and become more, and I quote, sensible and tidy, end of quote. At the same time, the periodical uh, approached literate female readers and urged them to invest more of their time in reading newspapers because a woman who reads a newspaper knows everything. For the discussion of Iranian women magazines of the 1960s and 1970s, the historical significance of this first periodical lies in being a forerunner in terms of certain characteristics that came to be identified with the genre. I specifically refer to the depoliticized tone of this publication, its reliance on scientific expertise, its secular outlook, and the essentials it drew from Western women's periodicals. These attributes continued to characterize women's magazines of the late Pahlavi era, and as elsewhere had an influence in shaping the image of the modern woman they present. Um, I stopped when I explained about Donesh and how uh, it actually uh, symbolized a continuation um, in terms of the later period magazines for women. Um, so what I can say is that uh, there are, are some attributes that uh, we can find um, also in, uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s. And um, I can say that some of the obstacles that uh, pioneer women uh, in the, the um, field of uh, the press in Iran witnessed in the early decades of the 20th century were also uh, determinantal for uh, the later period. So um, I will continue that one such obstacle was related to the high illiteracy rates in the country. In 1925, literacy rate among urban women in Iran was barely 5%. Three decades later, according to the 1956 census, it reached 7.3% nationally. 
the low literacy rate, especially among women, had major implications. It implicated the circulation of print media, the formation of readership, and the number of potential female writers who could contribute to their content. These figures also explain why expanding education was the principal objective of the early women's activists in Iran. Women who, uh, who founded the first periodicals strongly believed in education. They established associations, founded girls' schools, and used the press to further their cause. Although Iranian print media pioneers consistently supported the right of women to attain practical information, they essentially did not un undermine women's traditional roles in the family. Many of the pioneers in the field passed the legacy on to their daughters and to their students. Their messages typically referred to a national framework to legitimize their claims. So they argued that women needed education and more social opportunities in order to raise a better educated generation. Patriotic notions were emerging, especially on the backdrop of growing foreign influence, especially European influence in the early 20th century. The response was manifested in Iran's ambivalent perception of the West, fluctuating between admiration, suspicion, and hostility. Notions of modern womanhood were also affected by this ambivalent perception of the West. The more outspoken and affluent upper-class women who were politically aware patriots worked to advance women's cause to enlighten and awake the less privileged among them while maintaining the ideal of a faithful wife and a devoted mother. The new woman they came to represent and advance in the periodicals they published exhibited a degree of independent spirit. She also exercised more control over her life and showed interest in obtaining a more active role as member of society. The counter image of this new woman came to represent uneducated, the unprivileged, the superstitious, traditional, and backward woman. Variations of this image were incorporated into the modernization discourse of the Pahlavi state during the ensuing decades. By the mid 1950s, special periodicals designed for women sprout on the Iranian scene, but most of them survive only for brief periods due to lack of social support, financial setbacks, suppressive state policy, or the combination of these factors. In most cases, female publicists discovered what many learned before them, that publishing was not an easy undertaking, or in other words, that it was a lot easier to launch I've already mentioned that a central obstacle periodicals had to overcome was rooted in the low literacy rates, especially among women in Iran, and that it had many far reaching implications. Biographies of women journalists from the 1960s and early 1970s indicate that knowledge of foreign languages, in addition to academic education, was an important criterion, if not prerequisite, in the magazine's employment policy. The rivalry, the relatively high number of female employees with proficiency in foreign languages attest to the overriding importance of translations in Iran's print media. Translating of foreign sources was one aspect of a broader tendency of borrowings, which included extensive quotations and replicating a variety of visual materials. I hope you can see uh, this mosaic uh, of examples uh, with various degrees of modifications to the original text. There were some uh, protests from foreign governments against the general violations of international copyright laws, but overall this phenomenon of borrowings, whether visual or um, or a variety of other uh, content was a globalized uh, phenomenon and prevailed in earliest women's periodicals in Iran as well. 
other than being a global phenomenon, the substantial quantity of borrowings should be viewed in conjunction with a general fever of translations in the Iranian literary world and book industry. During three decades between 1942 and 1975, 60 to 80% of the 40,000 non-textbook titles printed in Iran were reported to be translations or adaptations of foreign texts. A cluster of factors uh, promoted the large proportions of borrowings through translations and replications of photographic materials in Iranian women's magazines. One factor was related to a, a chronic shortage of female journalists. Another factor derived from a scarcity of original materials produced by lo local women of letters. Most women in Iran, in, even in the 1960s and 1970s, were not accustomed to convey their personal experience in writing. They were also not accustomed to share their intimate thoughts with the general public in print, and their family circle and society at large did not encourage them to do so. When some sought to undermine sociocultural barriers surrounding the private domain and use the pen to unveil themselves, they encountered a general paternalistic tendency to devalue the significance of women's issues. Sustaining diversity in a rather small market was another difficulty the magazines managed to surmount by recycling materials. Borrowing and quoting from foreign sources also developed in Iran as a constructive approach for introducing sensitive topics. This also includes new innovations that raised moral controversies like the birth control pill. Quoting foreign sources was also effective for circumventing state censorship and restrictions on the media. In the mid 1970s, when the Shah enforced the ill-fated single party system, Etelaat Banovan and Zanaruz convert foreign news more extensively than the national news. Most significantly perhaps was the fact that borrowing contributed to produce a more economic product or in other words, media products tend to be expensive to produce, but cheap to reproduce. This fever of translation encountered its share of criticism. Some intellectuals commented in the late 1970s that Iranian mass media, mass media have become one giant translating machine. They claimed that the Iranian press is swamped by American articles chosen from conformist American papers. They also argued that only cultural endeavors which help to uphold imperialist and capitalist ideology are permitted to enter Iranian media. Against this backdrop, we can understand that the rise of Iranian commercial and popular magazines for women took place at the time of expanding mass media. During the 1960s and 1970s, the cultural diffusion of Westernization especially American influence, reached apex Iran. Anti-colonial notions of modernity were consolidating, and Iranian women also gained suffrage. These were years of great change and many challenges. I did a lot of uh, uh, talking so far, and I did not mention the name of, uh, I, I only mentioned briefly the names of uh, the two magazines that um, my book uh, is focusing on, and now, now it's uh, uh, time to say something about them. Uh, the first was Etelate Banovan, Ladies News. It began publication in 1957 and lasted until 1979. The second, uh, and perhaps the more known, is Zanaruz, The Modern Woman, or Today's Woman, which began publication in 1965 and continu continues uh, till this very day, making it the longest running weekly for women in Iran, um, although it is uh, a lot less popular than it used to be. By focusing on these two publications during the late Pahlavi era, I was able to demonstrate in my book that in their initial editorial philosophies, they did not present themselves as women magazines, but rather as 
family guides for a new life. They did, however, single out the modern woman as their main target audience. But they did not define exactly she was. Trying to answer the single Iranian woman proved to be a highly complicated task. There is enough evidence in system literature to sustain the claim that by the early decades of the 20th uh, century, the modern woman or the new woman as a modern figure was a transatlantic phenomenon, a term used by Angelique Richardson. On the one hand, scholars of different regions around the world have identified her as an intellectual and literary construct that was often formed to counterbalance the unforeseen challenges posed by the rapidly changing modern society. On the other hand, scholarly literature identified the modern woman as a marketing tool in advertisements and other prints. In Iran, as calls for women's awakening reverberated through the periodical press, changes in women's appearance and fashion were increasingly identified with westernization. As a result, images of a sexual and unveiled women were used as emblems of an emancipation and closely linked to aspirations of national progress and the modernization project throughout the early decades of the 20th century. The modern woman was an ideal and practice of creating a kind of being fit for the prosperous future of Iran. The image was set in opposition to the traditional veiled woman that came to signify social backwardness. For many advocates of Islamic modernism in the 1960s, most notably the sociologist Ali Shariati, the modern woman became the trope of all vices of modern consumer society. She also came to embody the vices of the mass culture that were believed to bring forth moral degradation. Her affiliation with the pejorative term that was toxicated woman, Zaner Zadeh, a woman struck by Western influence proliferated, especially among nationalists, social critics, and left-wing intellectuals. Editorials of women's magazines of the late Pahlavi era did not offer a clear definition of the modern woman. In contrast to the reductive definition of their critics, Iranian women's magazines offered their female readers an unprecedented range of representations of themselves. Many times these representations were ambiguous and conflicting. For example, contested views of femininity conveyed women the notion that they could bring about changes in their lives yet society was wedged on its costumes. They were also given the idea that they were being liberated from the shackles of the past, yet nationally responsible to transmit traditions to the next generations. What seems even more confusing is that alongside the modern woman, the magazines addressed their content to the modern girl who was approached by additional expressions. While studying the magazines in my search for the modern woman of the 1960s and 1970s and the gender implications she embodied, the question arose repeatedly in many guises. What made her modern? Was she an actual historical actor or an important commercial tool or rather a cultural hybrid? What was her connection with the foreign Western woman and what made her different? from the modern girl. An exploration of the questions led to one of the major arguments that uh, I advance in the book, that the modern woman and the modern girl embodied different aspects of modernity in relation to the self, the family, and society. It is also true that Iranian women's magazines took their cues for success from Western predecessors. This becomes apparent by their tendency to make practical information, news, creative writing, discussions, and entertainment sections in their content. 
They also model after Western advances in engraving and printing, but they had to adapt themselves to the local market and the nature and needs of the audiences. Being modern in Iran traditionally meant being attuned to the sensibilities and aesthetic preferences of the upper classes. This tendency witnessed certain changes with demographic shifts, urbanization, increased literacy rates in the 1970s, and vast expansion of a professional modern middle class in Iran. To be a modern woman, as these magazines conceived of it, was also to be very different kind of subject from the wife and mother of before. What was perhaps more emblematic of the period's changing perceptions reverberated in the 1968 headline, you are the first generation of women to use the birth control pill. It conveyed female readers the idea that they can have more control over their sexuality and readiness for procreation. Together with the potentiality of sexual liberties, women's magazines discovered the niche of female youth subculture and participated in the creation and construction of the new modern girl. Thus, modern girl was meant to appeal to educated middle-class teenagers. From the late 1950s onwards, youth has become an omnipresent locus of both public hopes and concerns. Iran at the time was depicted as an old land with a youthful population. By the early 1970s, over half of the country's population, and I underscore this fact, over half of the country's population, it means 55%, was reported to be under 20. This can partly explain why the rhetoric accompanying the reform program of the Shah reserved for the youth a paramount role in mobilizing the country and as a metaphor of renewal and promise for the future. Within this framework, the book explores quite extensively the modern girl who had not previously been acknowledged as a figure of distinct importance in Iranian historiography. This is probably because her image is overtly combined with that of the modern woman with whom she shares many similarities. Both the modern woman and the modern girl of the 1960s and 1970s are usually depicted in existing literature as a single archetype, unveiled, urban, literate, and most importantly, westernized. Westernized through an intimate engagement, especially with the international commodity culture of makeup, fashion, exercise, and diet control. Although the two cultural figures are often used interchangeably, temporary identity markers like family status, age group, and specific relationship with the nation and modernity set the experience of the new modern girl somewhat apart. The new modern girl was not yet confined by marriage, parenthood, or employment. Her relationship to modernity was not defined by her skills in managing time-saving electric home appliances or proficiency in other practices associated with the cult of domesticity. The modern girl was totally distinct from her mother. Rather than domesticated, she was the embodiment of revolutionary changes in appearance, attitudes, and aspirations. Rather than a simple one-dimensional archetype, the articulation of the modern girl elucidates the fluidity of the modern woman as a generic term, a larger critical category reconfigured by changing patterns of gender segregation and integration. It also illuminates on how the metatonymic usage of the modern woman was involved to depict the hopes, fears, pleasures, and dangers of the Iranian experience of Western style modernity in the late era of the monarchy in Iran. Furthermore, it is also suggested in the book that the modern girl was indispensably connected to the growing importance of youth as a specific target audience 
for advertisers and journalists, as well as for state policy. Youth acquired an increasing visibility, not only within the era's rhetoric, but also fomented the new and the ultra-modern in Iranian popular culture. For many professional middle-class urban women and late teens in Iran, these commercial magazines were the main cultural purveyors of modern femininity, global culture, social change, and cultural identity. In terms of outlook, instructions, and advice, they embraced every aspect of life in the pre-satellite TV and pre-internet era. They also aimed, through, though not always successfully, at promoting personal and group identity all-inclusive sense of national unity and sisterhood by establishing a network for communication among women. They also made an attempt to smooth regional, class, ethnic, racial, religious, and age differences, or conveniently ignored them. It is also uh, 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 within this intricacies, with all their complexity, that one finds the possibilities and limitations of defining new women, womanhood and the modern woman in the 1960s and 1970s Iran. Against this backdrop, I am both uh, proud and grateful that creating the modern Iranian woman joined a growing field of studies on women and gender in Iran. I hope, wait, I hope you can see uh, some of uh, the books on it. The books that I'm uh, referring to uh, covering uh, uh, different topics and aspects uh, in relation to Iranian women and gender, uh, as well as uh, a, rising, a rising subfield of uh, Pahlavi studies. And I will, okay, I gave a few examples here as well uh, that uh, is rising in the past few years. And uh, with this, I would like uh, to uh, uh, thank you all for uh, your patience. And I'm um, looking forward to your uh, questions. Well, thank you very much, Yoro, for that really excellent lecture. Historically well placed, and so much information you uh, packed into these uh, slides. Uh, for the audience who's listening, we will post your slide uh, on our website, and hopefully, we can also post your presentation you did for us on our website. And, give it a much more bigger uh, look. So before going, I ask my first question to you. Uh, I'm interested to know about uh, feminism in Iran. We talked about all these focus, about journalistic focus on the women and so forth. What, how would you measure the rise of feminism in Iran during your research? And how much did you see that so-called movement in Iran when you were researching the creating of modern women? Um, it's, it's a great question because uh, feminism uh, is, uh, is quite controversial as, uh, as a, a concept. And, and I did my best and it was uh, quite a challenge not to use it too much in the book because uh, uh, my intention uh, and attitudes towards the magazines were, was more uh, intertextually uh, uh, to go over as many issues as possible and see uh, what are the topics that are being discussed, what are um, uh, the concepts being used. Uh, and I didn't see uh, uh, the mentioning of, uh, of, of the term feminism so much, uh, but uh, more of uh, the uh, interpretation or translation of, of what feminism is. And I say that this is a problematic term because it usually represents the Western influence um, of women's movements um, on, on other countries. And, and this is very sensitive. Uh, even uh, today in, in Iran, it's problematic to talk about the women's movement because a woman's movement or feminism is something organized. And this is something very sensitive politically uh, in the past and, and also in the present. Uh, there is also uh, something that we have to take into consideration that during this years, even from the 1930s onward, uh, the state 
uh, under both Reza Shah and later under Muhammad Reza Shah, uh, took over uh, women's initiatives and, and both uh, Reza Shah and Muhammad Reza Shah presented themselves as champions of women's cause, as if they were the master, uh, mastermind behind um, uh, women's advancement and, and women's reforms. And that leaves out many women activists that pushed for these reforms and, and fought for these reforms. Uh, so uh, they were uh, left uh, in, in the sidelines, uh, perhaps uh, in, in, by choice, or, or uh, uh, they thought that it was uh, perhaps more instrumental to receive uh, uh, the umbrella of, of the state and of the monarchy for pushing these reforms, because we are talking about a, a patriarchal state. And some of the reforms were, uh, were very uh, advanced, even in terms of uh, Middle East uh, reforms uh, when it comes to women's rights. Uh, so it was very uh, complicated uh, back uh, in those days, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, as it is today. I hope it answers your question. Yes, you did. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah. Um... Just building on that question, um, and I would just ask everyone in attendance to put your questions in the chat, put them in the Q&A or raise your hand and we can get you to ask a question directly. Um, but as we wait for those to come in, I'll just ask a question. Um, you have the section about um, the Shah's mission for his country and gender as a factor of legitimacy for kind of the Shah's nation building project. And I'm just wondering, how much you see support for um, the transformation of women's place in society and all the different ways that you outlined so clearly and brilliantly in your book. Um, how much do you see that as being related to some type of ideological kind of driver of the Shah's policy or how much is it the result of kind of societal forces um, that were unleashed as a part of his modernization program? Um, you do such a good job talking about individuals and then broader programs such as the Literacy Corps. And so I'm just wondering how much um, women's advancement was part of the Shah's mission and how much of it was very practical or something that became outside of his control by the 60s and 70s. Okay, so I believe that we have to, it depends when you relate uh, uh, to uh, this question in terms of the 37 years that the Shah was, uh, was in power. Um, so um, I believe that by talking, interviewing people and reading the material, it was, it was complex. There, are, uh, there were activists that I was uh, interviewing and they said that the, the Shah only supported the issues that he felt he could promote. Uh, there were topics or, or issues that he uh, didn't want to get into and, uh, and it was passed or regulated differently uh, through, uh, uh, let's say the back door and not, uh, and not straight away. There, there is a, a lot of uh, uh, um, debate in literature about the influence of the women in his life uh, when it comes to his policies concerning, uh, concerning gender and women in Iran. Uh, some say that his sister uh, Ashraf was uh, was very dominant uh, in, in in her influence. Uh, others say that it was uh, Farah Diba, his his third wife. Um, there, when uh, when relating to the 1950s, they said it was Soraya. So it depends um, on on uh, what uh, years we are referring to, and also I can say um, uh, the account that we are reading. Of course, that the Shah himself wanted to present himself uh, a, as a champion, although there are uh, even foreign journalists who say that gender issues and, and women's issues and policies did not really uh, interest him. He was more interested in other topics or other topics were uh, higher on his agenda than these issues. And he left uh, uh, women's issues and also welfare issues uh, to the women in his family. And, and they were really promoting it through uh, uh, all sorts of uh, 
charity um, institutions. Uh, for better or worse, we're not going to get into that. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that it did, uh, it did them any good uh, being in charge on, on over so many uh, charity institutions, but they were trying to push that. Uh, and, he, he, uh, and we can also see that in the name giving of these uh, institutions of, of uh, whether it is uh, um, hospitals or uh, clinics or uh, um, um, uh, welfare uh, establishments that received the names of uh, the pal of the uh, women uh, in the family and, and not his own uh, name, which was given to other monuments in the country. Uh, so he was, we can see that he was allowing uh, this to happen. So I believe that he at least agreed with it. And he thought that this will bring um, uh, whether uh, a sort of advancement to the country. And it was also uh, um, very much for advancing a, a modern image of Iran in the international arena. And he knew that this was very helpful. So uh, on, on the one hand, he monopolized uh, women's affairs. And on the other hand, he was trying to show that this is something uh, uh, from, from below. But again, we can't really, really eliminate uh, all the women activists who were part of these changes and, on, on, and part of this movement to bring reform um, in, uh, in women's lives. And, and of course, in, in everything that is related to uh, to the family. That's great. Uh, one question that has come in here is that if uh, under the Shah's regime, we had the narrative of creating the modern Iranian women, as we have described that after the revolution, there is this narrative of creating the uh, typical modern Muslim Iranian women. And uh, how these two kind of uh, on their own terms have had a backlash in terms of how the state has tried to impose certain images on women. So like today, uh, the question is, well, the state Islamization policies of uh, imposing certain restrictions on women has had backlashes. Uh, how do you see this kind of constant struggle of defining the Iranian women from pre-revolution to post-revolution? What kind of impact does it have on the overall field of women's studies and gender studies that we are doing going on today. Okay, so, so first I would say that um, it testifies to the importance of, of women, both uh, in, in the 1960s, 1970s, and, and, and today, um, and in, in state policy. And in that respect, we can see one of one of the slides. Maybe uh, uh, it wasn't uh, quite clear, but to my surprise, um, it was in the 1960s and the 1970s. The modern Iranian woman was mostly unveiled, uh, and and the traditional woman was set against uh, the the image of of this modern woman. But in the in 1977, something changed, and. Uh, Zana was explained that um, the editorial was getting a lot of, of um, I almost said emails, but I meant letters <laughs> um, that, um, that requested uh, an, a, 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 an ideal for women who are more devout, who are Muslims, who want to be modern, but also uh, to preserve their modesty. And they felt that Zana Ruz was not doing them justice by showing only unveiled women and, and very limited um, um, options. So uh, uh, in 1977, Zana Ruz launched uh, a project. They went and asked six fashion designers in Tehran to try and come up with special designs that can replace the chador and be modest. Uh, and they, uh, they uh, published uh, these designs for, for a couple of weeks in, in uh, their uh, front pages. 
So this was the first time uh, that I could see something different that uh, the, these magazines, especially Zara Ruz, was giving a voice to women who up until that point were regarded as perhaps backward or the magazine tried not to relate to them um, as part of the modern women of Iran at that time. Uh, so I believe that uh, the Islamization that we are referring to um, started uh, earlier than uh, 1979 because women, there were women who were raising the veil as a sort of a flag of protest not necessarily uh, wishing for what would happen later on under the Islamic Republic, but it was for them uh, a kind of a protest that later developed and acquired additional symbolism and became a political tool in the hands of the new regime. Um, now, we also have to take into consideration that Iranian women's magazines um, continue to be published in Iran today, um, including Zanaruz, but the entire staff was replaced. One of the interesting, most fascinating, intriguing things about these magazines is, uh, is, is the transition between 1979 and 1978, I mean, 78 and 79, when we can see on the cover pages the changes, the, 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 the gradual changes from the super high sexualized uh, women portrayed uh, on these covers, suddenly we start to see uh, uh, religious figures, uh, less uh, uh, Western models uh, and, and different stories being told uh, through uh, the, the covers and the inside pages of these magazines. So, these magazines continue to be important vehicles uh, in in the hands of uh, in the hands of the regime. Although um, I, I have to say that these magazines, as commercial magazines, were established as private, uh, uh, privately owned magazines, and and nowadays they are they are more controlled. Uh, by uh, by the government, so it's a little bit different um, in terms of what it was in the 1960s and 1970s, and and what it what it is since 1979. Uh, I can also say, and this is uh, very surprising, that to talk only about propaganda um, and and only consider these magazines as a vehicle for state ideology will not show or, um, or um, embody the entire picture. Because even today we see that in women's magazines, although the staff has changed and we have uh, more, um, we can say uh, uh, the women who uh, are running these papers are some of them advocates of, of the regime, some of them are, um, close uh, uh, to perhaps uh, uh, the more pragmatist uh, factions in, in, in uh, politics or in, in society. But we also see, at least when it is possible, that women's magazines express and publish uh, issues that are controversial and they are trying to push and influence uh, uh, some change in the policies today. Thank you very much, Matt. That was, um, I'm recalling the image from your book with the covers from the late 1960s versus the late 1970s. And you move from, you know, kind of the mini skirt 1960s depiction to, you know, kind of uh, bailing on, on the covers and, um, you know, more Islamic um, symbolism. Um, so I was kind of envisioning that as you were describing that transition. Um, one of the strengths of the book, of course, is so many rich images to kind of think about. Um, I have a question um, about really one chapter, because another strength of your book is that um, at first glance, readers might think that it's a, focused on domestic Iranian history, but 
it's very global in, in perspective. And as you mentioned toward the end of the presentation, really representative of kind of that global approach to Pallavi studies. Um, and I felt like chapter six um, on, um, um, you know, study abroad, um, exogamy, brain drain, and the Western woman was uh, perhaps, you know, kind of the most global in perspective. And it also gave us a nice analysis of um, you know, masculinity, womanhood, law, uh, transnational migration, and how all of these kind of forces kind of came together. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could speak to that chapter and how um, it kind of situates this conversation in that global context. Okay, so uh, actually this chapter was the heart. Everything started with that chapter, although it's chapter six, <laughs> uh, because one of the things that surprised me most was uh, the debate. It was such a huge debate in, in um, the mid 1960s about, um, about the marriages between Iranians, especially Iranian students with foreign women. Uh, and, and it surprised me because it was debated in the Majlis and they were trying to figure out what to do with these uh, students who are uh, finding comfort when they are studying abroad in, in the arms of, of, uh, of foreign strange women. And this is a kind of a loss uh, to, uh, to young Iranian women uh, who are losing in the battle, uh, in the battle, <laughs> of course, in a metaphor. Um, so uh, I tried to uh, understand why it was such a problem because the numbers were so low. Uh, we are not talking about uh, thousands of, uh, of uh, Iranian students who were marrying foreign women. We were talking about perhaps a couple of hundreds uh, um, and, and, and not even that, but um, uh, from the... Um, from the figures that I could find, uh, there were more Iranian women marrying foreign men than, uh, than Iranian men marrying foreign women. So this was also a question of, of a, a kind of surprise, surprising issue that I was trying to figure out why. Um, and, and then I realized that it was related to, uh, to young Iranians who were studying abroad they were the most promising um, to the Iranian economy, to the Iranian future. And by marrying foreign women, sometimes, many times, they were staying outside of Iran and did not come back in order to contribute to the progress of the country. So they were conceived uh, to be unnationalistic. Uh, there were also talks about them trying, not wanting to, enlist to the army as they were supposed to. So there were debates whether to offer them an exemption from the army just, just for them to come home. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, pressure uh, and again, debate what can be done in order to bring these promising young people back home. Um, and and, and this, these were like, very urgent questions that I were trying to give answers to, and, and this uh, um, gave uh, um, the uh, the light to this uh, this uh, very problematic. I'm saying it's problematic because I had to cut to cut this chapter by half. It was so huge; it was it was taking over uh, the entire book. So it was uh, I I had to cut it. I now I'm. Uh, I feel uh, sorry for all the cut, but um, I think uh, it adds a lot uh, to the debate because I mentioned that the, the Western woman was a kind of a model for the new Iranian woman, but by becoming her nemesis or her rival on the heart of the Iranian man, then it, she wasn't the model anymore. Uh, so she was, it was, there was a possibility to treat her differently. And uh, in, in the 1960s and uh, uh, moreover in the 1970s, the Western woman became uh, a negative uh, model uh, in, in the writings of many intellectuals in Iran. 
uh, and, and there was a quest to find an authentic uh, indigenous uh, model for, for the Iranian woman. And, and we know that uh, um, from uh, a lot of work done on the writings of uh, Shariati, it was mentioned, and uh, he advanced the idea of uh, Fatima as a, as, as a new uh, and renewed model that he uh, shaped um, for, uh, for the modern woman in Iran and beyond. Great, Yara. This is a copy of your book and we would like our audience to see it. The paperback edition is out. So we strongly recommend it for everyone is available on Amazon too, that uh, Leora has written with fantastic uh, research and everything. That's great. I'll thank you for that answer, uh, Leora. We have one question. Uh, you can stop sharing. We have one question from the audience uh, about global sisterhood. Can you pull up that question, Leora? Okay. Uh, there is one question here. It says, do you think the idea of global sisterhood could benefit Iranian women? Or do you think this idea of global sisterhood is too westernized and would not translate well to the culture of Iran? Um, I believe that um, the idea of sisterhood was um, very much in fashion uh, in, uh, in the 1960s, perhaps in the 1970s, but I feel that once um, there were many ethnic groups and racial groups from different places uh, around the globe coming out and saying that it's not only the ideal of the modern woman, but the modern woman, the Western woman, modern woman is the white, urban, educated, elite woman, uh, then uh, the entire sisterhood collapsed. Uh, so it is problematic because on the one hand, we have uh, very much in common in terms of discrimination, in terms of domestic violence, uh, and we can see it in the Me Too movement, uh, that there are issues that are burning and relate to women and, and there is a general fight or a general movement. But on the other hand, uh, every society and, and every um, state is struggling and has its own context and its own um, uh, laws and its own um, local discriminations, dynamics, and way of advancing reform. Uh, now, we also know that many um, female activists in Iran today, both inside Iran and outside of Iran, are in a bit of a problem. If they are trying to push for reform and change from inside, they are being accused by some um, people or critics for cooperating with the regime and by cooperating with the regime, sustaining it and legitimizing it. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if they are not doing anything, they, then they cannot really bring any change and they are um, perceived as passive, as, as uh, um, women who are waiting for things to happen to them. Uh, and, and these were also accusations um, in, uh, in the 1950s and from the 1930s, 1940s, the 1950s, uh, women in Iran activists were, um, they were told that they did not have to fight for reform. They did not have to fight for anything because they accepted everything from above. The Shah decided everything. The Shah uh, uh, benefited them and they didn't have to do anything. And, and I believe that this portrayal or, or depiction is very problematic because uh, it drives again, women activists to, to the sidelines. Um, and, and I believe that these sensitivities um, are something that need to be considered. Uh, and, and you don't have to call something uh, uh, or tag it as feminist in order to um, uh, try and advance uh, uh, for change. You don't have to call it feminism in order to do that. Um, so if it's 
problematic, then uh, you can call it something else. Yeah. Well, isn't it? I hope it answers the question. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I got carried away a little bit. No, no, you did answer it. I think there are some uh, women opposition leaders like Massey Ali Najat who now see the expressions of women, Iranian women identity in Iran in terms of challenging the hijab. If they take off their hijab within the Iran today, that shows that they are expressing themselves. They are now becoming the real leaders of movement movement. So the question of hijab is now a critical political question for some of the opposition groups outside of Iran when it comes to women, that they want to judge the status of Iranian women today from their perspective is they challenge the hijab. Uh, is this the same thing, would you say, prevalent in other parts of the region? Like, would you say, in Israel today, when it comes to perceiving Iranian women, they do see it like this, that hijab is a kind of an issue that they think if it is removed, somehow leads to the liberation of the women in Iran today? Um, I believe that uh, the, the hijab uh, or the chador, there are different uh, coverings, head coverings in different societies in different countries. Um, it is the most prolific, uh, symbol of women's uh, oppression in Islamic societies, not only in Iran. Um, and I believe that this depiction has changed a bit, especially in recent years when, uh, for example, and I'm sorry for, uh, for uh, um, doing them uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, advertise them, but uh, we could see, uh, uh, okay, so I'm not gonna say the name of, uh, of the brand, but I will say that with the introduction of the Burkini and, and uh, the entrance of uh, Muslim women uh, into sports uh, and, and uh, the modest dress being advanced in, uh, in international fashion shows, uh, kind of, um, brought into the four different aspects of the issue of the veil. The thing is here, I think, uh, which is the most um, problematic is the issue of choice. If women, if a woman chooses to wear the veil anywhere she wants to, and this is her personal choice, then this is one thing. And if she's being enforced and it is used as a political um, political issue, uh, and 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 if women are not wearing the veil, they are being prosecuted and and being dragged in the streets and being beaten, or or uh, people are are throwing all, all sorts of things uh, at them. Um, then then this is something else. It's two different issues that we need to relate to. Uh, and again, it brings us back to the personal choice. And there are voices in Iran saying that because the veil is being forced on women, it lost its importance. It religious, the religious importance of the veil has been lost because it's being forced and enforced politically on women. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, the Islamic uh, Republic is trying to um, negotiate even, and we can see it in the different advertisements uh, that they are uh, releasing and, and publishing and putting in the streets, trying to show um, the veil in a positive way as a protection against all sorts of things uh, uh, that uh, might jeopardize uh, uh, women's uh, modesty or, or uh, virginity or uh, honesty uh, uh, in, in the public sphere. Uh, so we see that, uh, again, it's not as obvious as one might think that uh, women are uh, uh, all wearing it uh, out of their free will. But again, there are women in the Islamic world who are wearing uh, the veil and it is uh, by choice. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the Alliance for Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University Lior, and what type of program is it? Could you inform our audience about the study, Iranian studies in Israel a little bit and uh, 
uh, tell us how the program is structured and how is this direction going in contrast to other Iranian studies program? Okay, with pleasure. Uh, so uh, the Alliance Center for Iranian Studies uh, is a, a nonpartisan interdisciplinary research center uh, focusing on the promotion of knowledge and understanding of Iran. The center was established in 2005 uh, as a, the first of its kind in Israel at Tel Aviv University um, under the auspices of the Anton Faculty of Humanities. And uh, uh, through uh, innovative research conferences, colloquia, and lectures by local and visiting scholars, uh, the center promotes exchanges uh, across a variety of disciplines between scholars who focus on various aspects of Iranian studies, including Iran's history, society, and religion, as well as its role in the region and in the world. The center also promotes, and this perhaps relates to uh, your questions regarding the differences, um, the center also promotes uh, research of Iranian jury under the auspices of the Dr. Khabib Levy program. In its various activities, the center seeks to provide researchers, students, and the general public with a better understanding of the complex cultural and historical processes characterizing Iran and Iranian Jews. And uh, in recent years, we also inaugurated a special program for the study of Iranian Jews in Israel, uh, which is the first uh, program that operates under uh, academic uh, research. Um, so uh, this is more or less uh, uh, what uh, we are doing in our center. Mm -hmm. How many Iranian Jews are in Israel today, Yura? Uh, well, this is a, you are asking very problematic questions because, uh, <laughs> because uh, I'll explain, sure. <laughs> not because I don't have an answer or I'm trying to avoid an answer, but because there is a second and a third generation yeah. of, of, of Iranian Jews and, and it depends how you count them because some of them are the children of, of, I don't want to say ethnically mixed marriages within, um, within the Jewish denomination. So it's, it's, it's problematic to define it. Um, to the best of my knowledge, and, uh, and, and, uh, and from what I know, more or less is supposed to be uh, 250,000, something like that. Uh, but again, it depends uh, if you count or discount uh, the second and, and, and even by now, third generation of, of uh, Iranian Jews. And there is a large community of, uh, of uh, Iranian Jews residing outside of Israel as well uh, in the US. And of course, there is uh, uh, the Jewish community um, in Iran itself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we have one more final question. Matt, do you want to summarize uh, our discussion today for Europe? <clears throat> um, I don't know that I would summarize it necessarily, um, uh, but um, I would just kind of highlight, you know, kind of one of the strengths of the book and the presentation um, in the form of a question. Um, as far as the, the book structure, there is such, rich historiographic engagement and a lot of work through a range of interdisciplinary literatures. Um, so it's a real treat for those who want to see how scholars are using literatures outside of Iranian studies to um, open up new areas of exploration about Iranian studies. Um, and of course, it's also deeply empirical, right? The book is, um, you know, full of footnotes to um, all of the publications that have been referenced and especially uh, the two uh, primary publications um, that you feature. And I was just wondering if you could speak to kind of where those publications are located. I mean, is there like a central place where you can go to an archive and kind of analyze the kind of interior, entire set of the publications or was it Kind of a long-term collection process where you know you had to bring together all those primary sources yourself and perhaps even create uh, your own archive. Um, well, it, it was a long journey 
and uh, it started as, uh, as uh, not only a, a, a mental and intellectual journey, but also a, a journey to the United States, to some of the, uh, uh, the archives there. Uh, and here I have to uh, point to uh, two main archives that I was uh, um, using and I was uh, um, very fortunate to have the help uh, of, of the staff. It's, uh, it's Columbia University and, and Princeton University archive. Uh, and, and this is not because uh, these magazines cannot be found, but because being from Israel, I, can, I can't really travel. Uh, to Iran. So it started with a physical journey to, uh, to, the, um, to the magazines. Um, I also uh, encountered a lot of Iranians in Israel who collected uh, magazines, but they had uh, all sorts of clips and all sorts of uh, just uh, um, uh, sporadic uh, issues and not something systematic that I could go over uh, through 16 years of, of a publication. So uh, this was the beginning of, of the journey. Later on, I managed to, um, to get uh, digital uh, versions of the magazine. So it was more helpful <laughs> and uh, practical and easier to manage uh, the amount of, of information. So in the early years, I carried everything that I uh, Xerox in at Princeton on my back. <laughs> and now I have it on a, on a flash disk. Uh, so <laughs> this also <laughs> testifies to the changes of time and, and how to get to the material. Now, and how long it takes to research such a, such a wonderful book. So thank you. A long well, time. <laughs> yeah. With that, we want to really thank you, Leora, for joining our conversation today. We had a fantastic conversation and I really encourage all our audience to check your book out. And it's a great reading. And we hope you can come back again. We'd love to have you again as part of a series of discussions on Iran and Iranian women. And hopefully we could do more joint work with Alliance for Iran Studies. And I want to thank you on behalf of the Basketball Institute for doing so. And we really appreciate your taking time to come here. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and happy Thanksgiving. Thank yes, you. happy Thanksgiving to you too. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us. The recording of this thing will be posted on our website, plus the PowerPoints that the URA showed. And we hope to also post a summary of that presentation. Please check our website for uh, further information. And thank you all for uh, joining us. <laughs>